individual soul liberty. Maybe you've never heard that term before. This chapter we now come to has very strong connection with Baptist history. In fact, the phrase soul liberty would be greatest connected in, as far as a, uh, a denomination, if you're talking about Lutherans and Methodists and whatever, uh, Catholics or whatever, most greatly connected with the Baptist church and Baptist history. We're not talking about it because it's Baptist, though. We're talking about it because it is biblical. From the earliest identifications of Amer the Baptists that came to America way back through the Anabaptist movement in Europe and, in the, and into the Dark Ages even, Bible believers have held to this doctrine, the doctrine of individual soul liberty. In fact, it's very distinctive and very important for us to believe, especially as an independent Baptist church. This biblical doctrine is the reason that we would fight for the liberty of even other religions to practice freely in America. I don't know if you've ever thought that through. Why would we fight for religious liberty in America if we are very narrow-minded Christians? Why would we fight for, for instance, Mormons to have a right to, to believe and to practice as they believe and practice, although it's heresy and wrong and damnable? Why would we fight for that opportunity, that, that ability? This doctrine is the reason that Puritans sought refuge uh, away from England and Europe and why they came to the New World in the first place. It was based on this very simple principle of individual soul liberty. This doctrine is associated, as I said, primarily with Baptists above any other denomination, is the driving force really of the independent Baptist church movement. It is one of the primary reasons why tonight we are not in an American Baptist church, or we're not in a Southern Baptist church. It's, it's important for us to understand. It's why the independent Baptist churches, you go to this one, and you may go to another one in a different state, and the practices would be different. The methods would be different. Even some of the, uh, of the questions of theological debate may be different, a different perspective you may get in another church. You maybe get a little slanted difference in music. You may get a little slanted difference on the sovereignty of God and the free will of man in a different independent Baptist church, and that's okay. It's the reason why we gladly say that believers should govern themselves according to the Word of God. This matter of individual soul liberty. So what is it? What is soul liberty? Maybe you've come across it before. Here's a good definition. Every individual believer is responsible to his own conscience before God to interpret and live as he believes God has mandated in Scripture. I want to say it again. Slow it down, okay? You look at it. You let it sink in. Let your eyeballs and your ears hear it. Every individual believer is responsible to his own conscience before God to interpret and live as he believes God has mandated in Scripture. Every believer in here, not as a church, but as an individual person, even before you were saved, you had a moral obligation before God to understand what God says in his word, to interpret it the way you believe he, he wrote it and said it, and to live it and to practice it. That is soul liberty. There's no organization that can tell your conscience how to interpret the word of God. You have the scriptures, you have the responsibility, you have the obligation, and that is a great thing. Turn to Romans chapter 14, and I want you to see this here in the word of God. Romans chapter 14, there are many places as I was studying, and uh, we do not have time to turn to all of them, but this is kind of a, 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 a good thing for me to study because, uh, frankly, I have not studied through it before. Uh, I prepared for this message. And really, I understood the whole idea of the Baptist uh, distinctive of soul liberty and understood that, that it was something that historically we have held to but didn't understand really why. I think it's refreshing to understand why. In Romans chapter 14, beginning in verse number 5, let, let me begin verse number 1. It says, Him that is weak in the faith receive you. That is, let him come into your church, into your body, but not to doubtful disputations, not so he can come in there and cause trouble about what is right and wrong 
or doubting what you're doing or what you're practicing. You don't let the, a weak believer into your church to cause that kind of trouble. Verse number two, but for one believeth that he may eat all things. This is specifically not talking about, look up here, this isn't talking about seafood, which probably is what got me on Sunday morning for all those who wanted to know. Or uh, it's not talking about eating hamburgers that are 80% uh, lean. And, you know, this is not what this is talking about. This is talking about things that were offered to idols this in, 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 a, in a, uh, an idolatrous, idolatrous way. Okay? What the, that meat was sold in the market. Guess what? The, the idol did not consume the meat. I know that surprises some of you, that the idol, those stone idols, didn't actually eat the meat that was offered to them. But so you got this, you know, you got this best cut of T-bone here. So what do you do with it, right? You sell it in the marketplace. The money, some of the money did go to profit the pagan temple, all right? Christians of that day, they're walking through the marketplace. You know, one guy grabs a T-bone steak that was offered to an idol, goes home and enjoys a great barbecue for the Lord. Thank you, Lord, for the steak. Another guy says, how in the world can you do that? That was offered to an idol. Some of that money is going to go to, to temple worship, to, to pagan temple worship. How in the world can you eat that? Probably most independent Baptists would be in that second group. How dare you? It's got to be wrong. Are you enjoying that? It's got to be wrong. <laughs> it's just a joke. All right. The Lord says very clearly, look what the Lord says. It may surprise you what he says. We need to learn what he says. It says... Verse 2, for one believeth that he may eat all things, another who is weak eateth herbs. He's not going to eat that meat. Let him that eateth despise him that eateth not. Let not, uh, excuse me, let not him that eateth despise him that eateth not. Let, and let not him that eateth not judge him that eateth. For God hath received him. Who art thou that judgest another man's servant? To his own master he standeth or fall. Yea, he is able, yea, he uh, shall be holden up by the Lord, that is, approved by the Lord. For God is able to make him stand. One man esteemeth one day above another. Look up here. This was Jewish holy days. They were New Testament Christians now. Some of the New Testament believers who were Jewish thought that they still should keep these feast days and these special days, okay? You know, we still should do this. Others said, why? We're believers. We're New Testament believers. We're not of the law anymore. Let, you know, we're not, I don't have to do all this ritual anymore. Look what the Lord says. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. He that regardeth the day regardeth it unto the Lord. And he that regardeth not the day to the Lord, he doth not regard it. He that eateth, eateth to the Lord, for he giveth God thanks. And he that eateth not to the Lord, he eateth not and giveth God thanks. For none of us liveth to himself, and no man dieth to himself. For whether we live or whether we, uh, or whether we, we live, we live unto the Lord. And whether we die, we die unto the Lord. Whether we live, therefore, or die, we are the Lord's. This is a tongue twister, verse 9. For to this end Christ doth uh, both died and rose and revived that he might be Lord both of the dead and the living. He is the Lord, not you who judge you know, your brother in questionable things. Verse 10. But why dost thou judge thy brother? Or why dost thou set at naught thy brother? Or say that he's nothing because he eats this temple meat or, or he doesn't go to these feast days, uh, the old Jewish ones. For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For it is written, as I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess to me. So then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. Wow. Now, you know, this is, this is different thinking, and we need to understand this, that every man has soul liberty before God in areas of conscience, in areas that are not very specific in the Word of God. Okay? Uh, the context here, it's an amazing passage that it really frames, this kind of frames Baptist thought historically. The context is, is different believers making choices in gray areas of liberty, whether it's right or wrong for them to do. And, and you see that it's not just, it's just not cut and dry. The one guy, he eats the meat and thanks the Lord. The other guy, he doesn't eat the meat. He won't do that and thanks the Lord. And which one's right? Both. One guy goes to the festival, feast, and, or the festivals, the old Jewish festivals, and he thinks it's right to do that. He goes and, and regards it to the Lord. The other guy doesn't go, and he regards it to the Lord. He's right with the Lord. And which one's right? Both. Wow. We need to understand the issues here of eating idol uh, meat and keeping Jewish special days. They're, 
there were not there were not clear new test